Good morning. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord, is it not? Uh, before we look into God's word, I wanted to just share uh, just a couple things uh, first. Uh, and the first thing I want to say is thank you. Thank you uh, on behalf of my family uh, as we feel loved uh, to be here. Uh, we feel welcomed uh, to be a part of the Southgate family, and we feel that significantly. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we said that and mentioned that. I know uh, many were with Kelly yesterday, and so with uh, the ladies' event, and she greatly appreciated that also. Uh, and so we just wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for your love and welcome of me and my family here. Also wanted to share uh, just a note of praise, because I know many of you have been praying uh, significantly for us in the area of where are we living, and so in being uh, kind of putting down some roots here, and so we were able to close on a home that we purchased this last Friday, uh, so we feel like we are official Springfield residents now, uh, and so able to be here, and so that is a joy. <clears throat> Uh, and so again, we praise the Lord for that, and that's been a little bit of a journey, as some of you know, uh, but it is neat to see his hand uh, even in that, and so we are very thankful for that. Uh, we also, just, just a little bit, uh, I have enjoyed this last week, was kind of my first full week with the staff, uh, and so just enjoyed getting to know them and just wanted to encourage you uh, that the staff has such a significant heart to serve this body. Uh, and so they do a lot of hard work. They're working behind the scenes an awful lot to make sure that this body is equipped uh, to be able to do what it needs to do to follow the calling of the Lord. Uh, and so just enjoyed getting to know them, and I am looking forward to working and serving alongside them, serving this local body. Uh, and just one last thing is just wanted to give a special welcome. Uh, and so Pastor Jeff Whitaker, and he's probably like, why are you saying anything about me? Uh, and his wife, Linda, are sitting there. They, uh, I've served alongside Jeff for 15 plus years. Uh, and so up in Michigan, and so they're kind of making, they've had a long trip and they're making their way back to Kalamazoo. And so they stopped here and uh, you may, you don't know it, but you've seen him before because he was on the screen at one point and so saying some kind words a while ago because he's one of my references and they are a dear couple to us and so it's a blessing to have them uh, here also this morning. But as we look at God's words, I wanted to say that we are going to start together in the book of Ephesians, looking at what does God have to tell us in this book and this morning's going to be a little different, and so we're going to kind of go through some introductory material and just looking at the book and a little bit of the background, and then we're going to look at verses one and two. And no, we're not going to only go through two verses each week. We will go through a little bit greater uh, sections of scripture, but this week we're, we're only going to be able to get through the first two verses and seeing the significance of the introduction uh, that we have uh, in the book of Ephesians. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to make sure I get this going correctly. There we go. So what we're looking at today is Paul introduces the church to being in Christ. This idea of in Christ will come up over and over and over again as we look through the book of Ephesians. And it may not always be in Christ, but through Christ, by Christ, uh, and so in a couple other different descriptions there. And so as we look at this book, the first thing that we really understand is that uh, Paul wrote this uh, during a time when he is imprisoned. Uh, he wrote it kind of alongside a few other letters uh, to like the Philippians and the Colossians and the Philemon. And so he's writing these, he's imprisoned, and he's writing letters. And one of them he writes is this book of Ephesians that we're going to be looking at. And uh, 
the only, this is kind of near the end of his, his life. It's in the first imprisonment. He's going to go through a second imprisonment. And the only books that he writes after this are specific letters that he writes to both Timothy, Timothy and Titus. So this is kind of the second to last batch of letters that he writes, at least that we have recorded for us and collected for us in God's words. Um, but it's, it's getting near the end. And we're going to look at kind of some significance uh, as we look at this is, I'll get this right, I'll get it right. And so is that this was a circular letter. And so there are some significance to looking at Ephesians being a circular letter is it changes a little bit of the content that you're going to see communicated in the letter. Now, if you think about Paul, you think about all of his writings, you would understand that he is a very relational person. And so you think about all the different ones. He's commending different people. He is, he's calling out people's sins specifically in these letters. You think about the letters to Timothy and Titus. He's writing them to specific individuals. And he also likes to write with a lot of family terms. You look through his books and you'll see my brother's. And so he has a deep love and care and connection to the people that he writes to. But one thing is interesting about Ephesians. You're looking through it and you're not going to see some people that are specifically commended by him. You're not going to see specific sins that are called out and people that are named as he is addressing certain things that need to be changed. So a lot of people will look and say, well, this is, there's a little bit more general topics that are being discussed, and he's writing some general things to the church. Um, so that's why they think it's a circular letter. It was not meant to go only and primarily to one location but rather is to go to a location, then be passed along to another local body, another local body, and another local body. So they all have these encouragements on what does it mean for us to be the church? This is all very new to them. It's very fresh. And Paul's giving some instructions on how do we operate together? How do we live for the Lord together as his body, as Christ is the head of this church? So just a couple examples and a couple uh, of things that uh, just to kind of explain and help us see and understand what we're looking at is Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. Let's read it. It says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Jesus Christ, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. This is written, obviously, to the, to the Colossians, to a church that's in Colossae, and he mentions Epaphras specifically. And if you look, he says, he is one of you. And so he's mentioning someone that's specifically at that location, and he commends him. He says, man, he is praying for you. And we could see this. We could go through multiple examples, but this is someone they knew, someone that would have, might have been sitting in the area or maybe reading the letter themselves as the letter was read to the church. And he's saying, I want to make mention of this individual in a positive way. One that is a familiar example kind of on the other side of things is I entreat Iodia and, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, Help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Again, another one of his letters written to the Philippians where he is addressing these two ladies that have served well at times, but there is a disagreement of some sort. And so we don't know what that is. So he is saying, I am specifically asking these ladies to be in agreement, whatever that disagreement is, to move beyond it, resolve it. And then he even goes beyond and he's saying, church, those of you that are there, the ones that I'm writing to, please help. Come alongside. I ask you also, help these women. Now, if the primary thing, primary focus on these was a circular letter, it wouldn't make as much sense because I don't think in every church there was these two ladies and specifically their names and, and the same problem, 
but he's addressing something specific to the church in Philippi and saying, this is, this is what you need to be doing. Now, there was a secondary purpose pretty much in a lot of Paul's letters, and you see it in a couple different areas, where there is some circular nature to them. But a primary focus of Philippians is to the church in Philippi, with a secondary purpose of being encouragement to everyone else. If we look at Ephesians, a primary focus is this idea of being a circular letter where instruction is given to multiple churches. So we have Paul talking about specific people, specific situations in these letters, but we aren't going to see this in Ephesians. Uh, the closest it's going to be is when he gets and says, hey, this one person is, is delivering this letter. He's taking it uh, for me because he's imprisoned. He can't take it on his own. So instead of discussing specific situations, he's discussing some general encouragement for the church. And that's kind of a big theme that we're going to see throughout this is this idea that there's instructions of, of how we are to get along, how we are to operate, how the church with, the, with God, Jesus Christ as its head, is supposed to be. Now, specifically looking in Ephesians, what we're going to look and what we're going to notice is that this book is divided into two general pieces. And a few weeks ago, probably about three or four weeks ago, if you were in uh, the Equip You class, the family, the family one, I don't know the specific name, but Scott was teaching in there, and Kelly and I had a chance to be there, and he did a really good job explaining this idea of Ephesians is split into two pieces. So if you were there at that time, you're going to hear a little bit of some of those same things, uh, but chapters one through three is separated from chapters four through six. They go together, they fit together, but what is being communicated and what the purpose of them is different. If we're to look at chapters one through three, we would look at this idea that we need to have right thinking. We need to have a right theology. We need to have a right understanding of who God is, who we are, the situation that we're in. So a lot of it is having that right theology, having that right thinking. And you go on to chapters four through six, and you see a very dramatic shift take place. Instead of right thinking, he says, now here, I want to tell you, here is right living. Here's what you're supposed to be doing. So he goes through the thinking first, because the way that we think, the way that we operate, the what we believe needs to impact how we behave, how we respond, how we live. So we need to have a right understanding of what God says the church is and who he is and our relationship with him, and that should impact how we live with one another. We even go in, you're going to see some specific relationships as he goes through husbands and wives. If all of this at the beginning is true, this is how you're supposed to operate in relationship with one another parents and children. Then he goes through slaves and masters. So it's very practical living, very practical in what we are supposed to be doing. So that's the kind of the main division that we have. But we're going to see some common themes tie those two together. And it's going to be obvious, and you're going to get sick of me saying it, because it's going to be almost every single week, the idea of right thinking is we are in Christ. We are through Christ. We are with Christ. He gets very clear. The central theme has nothing to do with us. The central theme in thinking correctly is because of Christ, who he is and what he has done for us. That's the only reason we can have correct thinking. So he's going to go over that again and again and again, and we're going to see how little we matter in the scheme of things and how much Christ matters because he means everything. So that is significant and that is huge. He also talks about riches. And we're going to see these riches kind of come up multiple times, but the riches are only important because we are in Christ. We only have those riches because it comes through Christ. 
So the centrality of Christ is going to be huge. It's going to be significant. The fellowship that we have, we're going to learn it's because we are in Christ. So Christ, we're going to see is the power and the active agent, and we're just the ones that receive. Our salvation has nothing to do because of our works, because of the things that we have done that are good, but rather it's because of what Christ did on the cross for us. We are receivers. We're going to look through and you're going to see he did this. He did this. It's because of him. It's because of him. It's in Christ. It's through Christ. It's by Christ. But we're going to look at it and say it talks about us. It does mention us, but we are on the receiving end of what Christ has done. We're also going to see that theme continue through chapters 4, 5, and 6. As because we have right thinking in Christ, it makes it clear that we are to act and behave differently because of Christ. And so it's, if we are saved, that should show up in the way that we live, the decisions that we make, the interactions that we have with one another, the interactions we have with the world. Now, this illustration had a lot more impact when I was from the state up north. And so, and I think you get where I'm going. And so, but I would tell them, and it was clear and it was true, that I'm a Buckeye fan. I am a Buckeye fan. I bleed scarlet and gray. And so I grew up in Michigan, even from my youngest years, but my dad was born and raised in Ohio. And so and we always say, he raised us right. And so he raised us right following the right team. Uh, and so and even mentioning the stuff up there, and I have to say, for the 16 plus years that we were there, most of the time, it was very good years. And so to be a Buckeye fan living in the state up north. But if I were to tell you, I'm a Buckeye fan. I enjoy the Buckeyes. I like the Buckeyes. And yet I'd wear these other two colors all the time. You would wonder, is that really true? If I were a Buckeye fan and I had no clue what was going on in the world with them, and so I didn't follow them at all, or I'd be watching a game and I'm cheering for the wrong team, you'd be like, something is wrong with him because what he's saying and what he is doing does not line up. Let's say you would go into my office and there was all this bad stuff on the walls. You would question, one, my integrity, and so in you two, you'd just be like, that doesn't line up. It doesn't match up. That's the same idea as we are saying that we are believers. If we are saying we are in Christ, if we have truly asked for him to, to save us from our sins, our lives should match up. It should be obvious to coworkers. It should be obvious to the people that are out there we see in the supermarkets. It should be obvious to family that does not know him as their savior that something's different. He says this and his life matches what he says. That's what this is. That's that common theme that we see here. We need to have that right understanding. And then as we say, this is true for me. I want to be a follower of Christ. I'm trying to live in a way that honors him. I am asking God to help me to do that. Our lives should show that that is true. So that's the connection between this right thinking and right living. They should line up. They should match up. That's a common theme that we're going to see running through this entire book. Now, as we look through right thinking, that's going to look a little different, even in the way that we discuss things. And as we look through right living, it's, those are really easy to apply. He says, you do this. You need to be saying, Christ, Jesus, help me to do that because I want my life to reflect what you call us to as your children. Being in Christ should transform how we live and not simply stay in that mental category of knowing something to be true. We're also going to see the centrality of Christ in Paul's introduction to the book as we look at it this morning. And what I'm going to do is I want to take a look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 2 right now. So I mentioned it earlier, hopefully you're there, but if you're not, and I would encourage you, follow along 
uh, in God's Word. Uh, if you're able, I would ask that you stand with me as we go through the reading of God's Word this morning. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 2 says this, Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be seated. Let's go ahead and pray and ask that God would soften our hearts as we start this journey together through the book of Ephesians. God, we are thankful We are thankful that you give us instruction in your words. You didn't just place us on this world and say, go for it. But rather, you give us instructions on how we're to think, how we are to understand who you are, how we are to understand ourselves and our need for you, and how we are to understand how Christ is central in everything. Thank you. God, we are also thankful that you give instructions on how we are to live, how we are to interact with one another, how we are to operate with Christ as our head. God, help us not to see this as a to-do list, that if I do this, I'm good enough, but rather to see it as a a reflection and a love for you and saying, God, this is how you desire me to live. This is how I can give you honor and glory. Help me to do that. God, help that to be our heart. Help us to have humility as we look at your word and an open heart to receive it. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, an introduction, and this is a letter. This is an introduction to a letter. And as I think of the last few weeks, I think we have received, our family, a lot of letters. A lot of letters. We've received letters from the Kalamazoo area, from dear friends there. We have received an awful lot of wonderful letters from this local loving body here. We've received letters that have, uh, they're from our friends. We've received letters from so many different people here. We've received letters uh, that went to our house in Kalamazoo uh, that have been forwarded here. We've received letters that have come through my parents' home. We've received letters that have come through Kelly's parents' home. We've received letters even from people back in Kalamazoo that have come through the church here. They said, we don't know where you're living, but we at least know where you're at. Uh, So we've received all sorts of letters. We've received letters from uh, people that we know. We've received letters from people that we don't know. Hopefully we will be getting to know them soon. We've received letters from people we don't even know who they're from. They're anonymous. So we've received an awful lot of letters. But there's one common thing that is among all of those letters that we've received. The letters we've received have been written from somebody. They've been written to somebody. And they've been written for a specific purpose. And those purposes have varied uh, in all of those letters that we've received. But that's common among all those different letters. So as we look at the introduction to the book of Ephesians, what we're going to see is that, yes, this letter has been written from somebody, Paul. And so when we saw that earlier, as we looked and said, this is when he wrote it and kind of his life situation, but it's been written to people, as we'll see in a little bit, and it's been written for a specific purpose. Now, we're going to unpack a little bit of that purpose over the weeks and months to come, but we'll introduce that this morning. So all those letters have been wonderful, and we get to enjoy this letter together. This morning, we're just going to scratch the surface on it as we look at this introduction, Uh, but I, I hope that we'll be able to say, wow, there actually is a lot to this introduction. Now, what we're going to look at in this introduction is three, there's kind of three main lines that you see there, and you see that it's Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. That's the first one. The second one is to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. And then the third one is grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Each of those is kind of interesting in the construction that Paul used. There's kind of pairs. 
And so with each of those, there's either one pair or even multiple pairs as we look at the third line. But we're going to see these pairs in the way that he's kind of giving examples or, or emphasizing certain things even in the introduction here. So the first of these statements communicates Paul as an apostle. And so that we're going to look at the very beginning and uh, with this as an apostle, and Paul uses this description as an apostle not to puff himself up, but to kind of give an understanding of whose authority he's communicating on behalf of. And we even see this authority, it's kind of a dual authority that we see mentioned here. He says, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So he's making it clear that his authority does not come from himself. Rather, he's an apostle. He is a sent one. That's what apostle means, someone that's sent. So he is sent on behalf of God the Father. And so and he is sent on behalf of Jesus Christ to be an apostle, to bring this message on someone else's authority. Now, the focus of being an apostle as he writes a letter shouldn't be a kind of a surprise to us uh, because when I was candidating here and sharing there, we looked at the book of 2 Corinthians. And we looked at that book there and we saw a significant part and a significant motivation as to what Paul was doing there is he was defending his role as an apostle. He was being attacked there were false teachers that were coming at him trying to discredit both him and his message so that the people that he was communicating with would follow the false teachers. But rather, Paul was defending himself and just saying, no, this really is on behalf of God. I am really bringing a message that's on behalf of the Lord's and bringing that to you. So that was significant to him that he bring that up and he defended himself. And as I mentioned before, 2 Corinthians was written earlier in his life. So that was something that he dealt with a few years before he gets to writing the book of Ephesians. So it's still important for him, still significant for him to say, I'm an apostle. I am writing on behalf of someone else. I have this authority, not because of me and because I'm great, because that's not true, and we've figured that out before. But what he says is, this is God. This is his message to his people. I'm just communicating that message. I'm just relaying what God is sharing with me because that is significant. Paul wanted to make it clear that he was writing and teaching as an apostle, not based upon his authority, but God's authority. Now, the idea of authority is also something that's very significant with Paul. And we may be thinking, why is this such a big deal? This is, this is Paul's motivation. This is why it's significant to him. He's saying, this is God sending me. I have a responsibility as an ambassador for the Lord to communicate this well. Now, this was even significant for Paul before his conversion, this idea of authority, communicating on behalf of someone else. So we can look back before that time uh, of Paul and his, and his authority, and we can look at to Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 2, and it says, but Saul, this was before the Lord changed his name, and his name was now Paul, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So Paul's looking at his responsibility. He's looking, saying, I am keeping this religion that I have pure. That's what he sees as his role. That's what he sees as what he's doing. And he's doing that in Jerusalem. But he's saying, you know what? There are people following the way. The way is what the followers of Jesus Christ, you see that terminology used multiple times to describe followers of Jesus as the way. So he's saying, I know there's more besides just in Jerusalem. So he goes to find the authority so he can continue what he's doing elsewhere because he doesn't have jurisdiction over that. And so he's saying, I need to have the right authority to go find people of the way and bring them back to Jerusalem so they can be tried and everything else and imprisoned and some even killed 
for their beliefs in Christ. As we know, following this, he's given that permission. The high priest send them with their blessing saying, yes, go do that. So what does Paul do? He gets the authority and immediately he starts marching to Damascus. Now we know that he doesn't accomplish his original goal. That's where God gets a hold of him and changes his life and he has the direction changed forever. But it's this idea of authority. He got the authority on behalf of someone else and said, that's what I need to do. My whole life, all my energy, all my focus, based on what I'm being called and sent to do. That's how Paul operates. Now we see kind of the other side of this idea of authority where Paul, uh, Saul at the time, grants authority. And so in Acts chapter 7, 58, this is talking about Stephen and the stoning of Stephen. It says, then they cast him out of the city, that's Stephen, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, what is happening here is that Saul is giving them permission to move forward, essentially, with the execution. He is the one that says, yes, I give you permission. So they lay down their coats at his feet because they say, you are the one that is granting this permission for us to do what we're about to do. He is giving authority for them to carry out the action. Even though Saul doesn't do it himself, he grants authority. So authority is very significant for Paul. And so we see that coming and we see, man, I am an apostle, I am a sent one. This is significant. I need to do whatever I can to follow the Lord, to do what he's called me to do. I have a mission and that's what needs to happen. Paul understands authority. He understands his role in relationship to authority He knew God called him to be apostle and he was going to act accordingly with all his might. My question for us is, do we do the same? We are called ambassadors of God. Sharing a message on his behalf, is that a focus for us? Or does that come second, third, fourth, fifth down the list? where I have these other things that I need to accomplish, and if I can get to it, I'll get to it. That was not Paul. This was primary, first, the main thing that he was trying to accomplish, being an ambassador for God. That's going to be a challenge. That's going to be a theme that we see through, going through this book of Ephesians. We're going to be challenged with, am I having Christ, being in Christ, serving through Christ as that number one focus of my life? Does that impact the way that I go to work? Or is work primary? And if I have an opportunity to talk to someone at lunch or something, I'll do that. Does that impact our integrity? Does that impact our relationship with our neighbors? And saying, man, I'm not a super social person. But because God called me to be an ambassador, I'm going to meet those neighbors. I'm going to share that message. Sometimes we get embarrassed if they ask a question that we don't know. And honestly, if we are ambassadors of Christ and they don't like his message, we don't need to worry about it. They have an issue with the Lord. They don't have an issue with us. Rather, we are a communicator of God's message. We are that ambassador. He has all of us as sent ones now. We're going to see this idea of thinking and acting being very significant. We're going to walk through our identity and say our identity is in Christ. Does that impact things? Does that change things? We're also going to see, especially in chapter 4, that we are called to walk in a manner or live in a manner that is worthy of our calling. So as we think about this ambassadors of Christ, that we are in Christ now, things need to be different. Just like with Israel. 
Israel, I mean, I'm going through Leviticus and my personal reading plan right now. And I mean, it's, it's difficult to get through Leviticus at times. And you see all these rules and regulations and sacrifices and everything they had to do. The whole purpose was because they were in relationship with the Lord. And he says a couple things. One, I want you to know how to be in right relationship with me. And two, I call you to be different than the rest of the world. The same is for us today. He's calling us to be in right relationship, to think and to live in right relationship with him today. And he's calling us to be different than the world. All of that out of Paul. He's an apostle. He's a sent one. And we are to follow his example. Not only does Paul address himself as the sender of this letter, he also addresses the recipient. And it's to the saints. Uh, again, we see another pair he talks about to the saints that are in Ephesus and to the saints that are the faithful ones. But as we think about saints, uh, this idea is uh, it's significant because Pastor Jeff and I served under a senior pastor that he would often say, if he's referencing us, St. Jeremy. And so he would all the time, whether we're meeting new people or it's just one-on-one, -on -one, he'd call us saint. And it became really interesting sometimes, maybe when we're out to eat or we're at various places or maybe it's a hospital visit and there's someone with either a Catholic, like a Roman Catholic or an Orthodox background and he'd come and he'd say, hey, this is St. Jeremy. And they'd be like, the eyes would get big or they'd be confused and uh, it'd be like, I, I don't understand because their understanding of saint is they have done enough good things to be recognized as a saint. Where that's not what we see in God's word as described as a saint, but rather it's those that have been sanctified by the Lord, they're all saints. So he would have an opportunity to explain to them what he meant. And it was kind of a little opportunity he used to have a gospel conversation with somebody. But it was interesting to see reactions when he was called saints. And so he'd say St. Jeremy or St. Pat or St. Scott or any of those, he would refer to us as saint whatever because we were fellow believers with him. And uh, this idea of saints... Paul gives kind of a further explanation as we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, which says this, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. So we get a very clear clue Paul is addressing believers. He's addressing the church. He's saying those that have already been sanctified, not those that have worked, made enough good works to be referenced as saints. No, anyone that has been sanctified, anyone that has had their sins washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ, those are the saints. He's saying that's who I'm speaking to. Paul then gives the, that pair, that explanation of the saints and if some of you are observant, you'll notice that there is a little footnote in many of our Bibles after this that tells us that in many of the earliest manuscripts, the phrase in Ephesus isn't even mentioned. And so that it's, it's, it's a little different, that it may have been added later, and there's a reason for that. That's more evidence where people would think this is a circular book. This was designed to go from church to church to church uh, and because it didn't have that original designation to the church of Ephesus. But rather, it was meant to be uh, to Asia Minor and the collection of churches there going to Asia Minor. And the church at Ephesus was the most significant church of the time and was most likely the first church that this went to so in order to differentiate, this is what a lot of believe, in order to differentiate this specific letter to other ones that were specific to different uh, churches, they put Ephesians there to say the believers at Ephesus, it would have been the first one that went to, the most significant. Paul spent three years with the believers before he sent this letter at Ephesus. So it would have been normal and natural 
to, be, to have that sent there. Uh, so it's just more evidence for seeing this as a circular book to give general instructions to the church. The second description that we see here is those that are faithful in Christ Jesus. Uh, I can't get through this without saying that in Christ Jesus once again. And so we're going to see that designation come up over and over and over. Uh, And so we want to point it out because that puts things in perspective for us. Uh, But this faithful in Christ Jesus, it does not mean those that are trying really hard. They're trying really hard and they're proving themselves to be faithful. And so they have been successful in being faithful up to this point. But rather, it it is more of a designation of those that have placed their faith in Christ. So it's another designation for being a believer. We could look ahead to kind of Ephesians uh, 2.8, where it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. So when it's saying those that have, they are the faithful ones, the ones that have placed their faith in Christ. So that's the significance of that, the idea of being faithful. Uh, we're going to see just kind of later this faithfulness kind of coming up uh, in a couple different ways. Uh, but what follows these recipients is that he's a, kind of using a common, um, a common address and so a common greeting that believers would have given to one another, and it's kind of with a blessing. So he opens up saying, I am Paul the apostle, the sent one. I have a mission. I have been given these words on authority by Jesus Christ, and I am delivering them to you, the believers, the faithful ones. And then he finishes this up with this grace to you and peace. One of those pairs, grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So as they were looking through this kind of common greeting, uh, Paul's addressing the believers as we know, so he would know that they have already experienced grace, God's grace. That's how they were able to be saved. Uh, And then he says, that's how peace comes. We have peace in our relationship with God that can be restored as we experience his grace. So that's that common greeting saying, I want you to continue experiencing God's grace and his peace. That's that common greeting that he gives. And then he also closes that up and and kind of mirrors verse one, as he says, this is from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's utilizing both God, the father and the son. And so it's a significant introduction. And if you look at the construction of the wording here, He's equating God the Father and Jesus Christ, giving, making sure that they know Jesus is God. He is deity. They are not two separate. They are together. So grace, and pe- grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. These are going to be significant themes, this grace and peace throughout the rest of the book as we go through this. He's going to continue this idea of being in Christ as we see it in kind of all three of these verses, that reference to Jesus Christ as he is the acting agent, and we graciously get to receive that gift from him. So even in these two verses of the greeting, he's setting the stage letting the readers know, letting each one of us know that our salvation and relationship with God has nothing to do with our works, but rather it is God's grace by which we can have peace with the Father. So in closing, I want, we've looked at these two short verses. We've seen a lot in them, but there's two things that I want us to remember and to be reminded of. First, we need to know that our, the identity and the role that we have has been given and we need to act on it. It's not because we earned it. It's not because of us. So we're going to be looking through this book and I would ask you, have open hearts, have open minds to say, what does God say my identity is? How do I act on that? Just like Paul knew his identity was in Christ, he knew his role was an apostle and that was his focus. 
we need to have that same focus. He's the one that gives us our marching orders, and we need to follow accordingly. The second one is that we need to prepare ourselves to humbly study this book together because we're going to see over and over in Christ, through Christ, with Christ. Sometimes it's hard to get past the idea that I don't determine my identity because a lot of times at work, it's whatever you do gets you promoted. Whatever you do gets you noticed. Whatever you do anywhere a lot of times gets you noticed gets you the recognition you feel you deserve, but this is different. We are in Christ, through Christ, with Christ. It's dependent on him. In a sense, this should actually excite us as we know we have limits. If any of you are like me, you know you have limits, but we can find our strength in an all-powerful and all-knowing God. So I want to leave with you the same greeting that Paul leaves for the Ephesian people. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear God, we are thankful to be able to look into a little bit of the background of this book and to see the the introduction that Paul wrote on your behalf as a sent one by you. And God, I hope this sets the stage for the future. As we get to see the blessings and the joy of what it means to be in Christ. To be able to see that we are saved by your power and not our own because we are prone to fail often. God, help us to take courage in what you have done for us and help that to translate into we can't do anything but be ambassadors for you making sure this world and this community, this Springfield greater community knows who you are because the light that shines in us, we just can't keep to ourselves. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus Christ's name, amen. You can go in peace this morning.